Thank you very much. Thank you for being a part of our Māori Television Anzac Day coverage for 2014. We really appreciate it. Okay. In researching for this interview, mm. uh, I've been struck by, and I think I've been amazed by your commitment, mm. and I think a better word actually is your passion mm-hmm. for restoring history, and in particular, history surrounding World War I. Mm. And I've often wondered why. Why is that? I mean, look, I, I grew up certainly with the First World War being very... Um, it was just something that was around in the 60s a lot more. Dad was in the Pukaru Bay RSA, and, and, and I used to get, sometimes go to the RSA with him. Um, and, you know, there were World War I guys there. So it was sort of a lot like it was all part, part of the community. And my grandfather, my father's father, was a, was, was a um, sergeant in, in, in the First World War. Uh, he was not, wasn't in the New Zealand Army, he was in the British Army, the, the, the South Wales borderers. But, but he was a professional soldier. He, he'd, he'd joined the Army in about 1911, and he went all the way through to 1919. And um, he, was, he was in Tsingtao in China in 1914 in Gallipoli, and he, he landed on, on Anzac Day in Gallipoli and went right the way through. And then he was wounded in the Somme the following year, got sent... To, to convalesce for a little while, then straight back, and he he finished out the war fighting. And you know, I I, I, I used to hear a lot about my my granddad, who was long dead. He died in 1940. Um, he won the DCM actually in Gallipoli and uh, got mentioned in the dispatches. So my father was very proud of him. And in, in some respects, you could say that I almost owe my existence to um, Gallipoli because Dad always Dad immig- immigrated here after the Second World War. And he met my mother here. And the only reason, as, an, as, a, as a POM, you know, that he chose New Zealand out of all the countries he could have immigrated to, had no relatives here, no knowledge of New Zealand, was that his father had always spoken very, very highly of the New Zealand troops in Gallipoli, that he had see, he, he had sort of been alongside fighting in Gallipoli. He always thought the New Zealanders were, were absolutely terrific. And that was good enough for Dad to actually choose New Zealand as the country. To, so, in a way, if he hadn't, if he'd chosen Canada or Australia, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't exist today. He wouldn't have, he would have met somebody else and uh, that particular event wouldn't have occurred. So, so it's, um, I, yeah, it's a strange little circle. Because my understanding is you you were very much into uh, digging up gardens and the and and and, and mm. the garden at home and and, and trying to build a, a trench like the trench in mm. Somme and, and things like that. Look, it was just something that kids did in those days. I I, I just got the feeling it was what everyone did, but maybe it wasn't. I don't know. <laughs> it probably wasn't. But um, you know, I I used to go and 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 and, and go up and down the street. I remember trying to get uniforms for my friends to wear because I was making little movies back then when I was about eight or nine years old, and I used to go knocking on doors and saying, "Can have you got any old uniforms?" Because that was the day, that was the time you could do that. You could actually knock on people's doors if you got old uniforms, and half the time you'd get lucky, and people would say, "Oh, okay, I'll go in the Bobby and Oh, yeah, you can you can have that. It'll be some amazing you know, tunic or tin hat or something. It would be that. That was a, it was a fun time to be, to be to be doing that sort of thing. You you've also talked about the eight millimeter camera that you were given as a young man, and how much of an influence that had on you. I was, you know, I was an only child, so I was kind of, you know, imaginative in the sense of, of, of having to take my, um, you know, my matchbox toys into the garden by myself and make little adventures with them, cutting roads in the side of dirt banks and then, then you know, doing Thunderbirds kind of rescues because I was really into the Thunderbirds TV show as well. And then uh, this camera suddenly sort of entered our lives. It was just a gift. And my Auntie Jean gave it to Mum um, as a Christmas present and... Um, Mum and Dad had no interest in cameras, really. But the idea was I was about seven, eight years old and, you know, I'd take home movies with. But I sort of grabbed this camera and it just became an extension of the stories I was doing and filming them and sort of figuring out little ways to tell stories with the camera, yeah. It seems like, uh, to me anyway, that you're living this fascination that you had as a child, the restoration work you've done, with, mm-hmm. especially with the World War One. Oh yeah, no, everything I do today is was is something as an extension of what I was doing when I was about eight, eight or nine, ten years old. I'm not doing anything new. It's just, it's quite sad, really. <laughs> not, not, <laughs> not in a way, but I haven't developed any new interests along the way. I'm just simply I'm just simply able to to sort of have a lot more fun with the interests that I had when I was and I was eight or nine years. And that, that, that is it. That's actually 
That is kind of a very accurate, accurate I, description. I, I don't think yeah. it's sad at all. I, I think it is, it is every little boy's dream <laughs> to be able to hold on to the fascination they had as a child and yeah, deliver it yeah, out in the their airfix, own. Little, little airfix plastic model planes have become big, big full-size <laughs> flying ones now. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of the fun I'm able to have now, which was kind of, kind of good. The most interesting thing is when you take an aircraft of which there are no known examples anywhere in the world, of which there are a lot of the First World War planes have that fate. And some of these are planes that, that were very, very common, very uh, man manufactured in their thousands during the war that, for whatever reason, have never have survived. There's none in museums, there's none in storage, and there's no, no examples. So they're gone, they're extinct, uh, essentially. Um, so like one like the FE-2B is a particular example of. We were able to get the, the drawings, the manufacturing drawings of the 1916 drawings. From those drawings, we built the plane. You know, all the books you read about the FE-2B, everyone's got a theories about it, but because no one's actually flown it since about 1922, no one's been able to fly one. Mm. And now, you know, we can actually fly it and we can analyse what it was really like. There's a lot of planes that we, we've, we're now flying that are the only examples in the world, and because we've built them, are the only examples for, for over the last 80, or 80 years or 90 years that, that have ever flown. And so you can actually, you know, the myths can sort of stop and people can really have a chance to actually to find out what they're, what they're really like. It takes passion, which is what I think mm. I see and hear when I hear you talk about yeah. all those planes and what you've been doing. And, yeah. and when yeah. I look at some of the other mm. work you've done, I've watched yeah. Heroes of Gallipoli, that two minutes, 55 uh, seconds, I think it is, of that footage in Gallipoli, the only footage yeah. that you restored, frame by frame mm -hmm. by frame. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy job. For me, it was, an it was an experiment. It was simply my curiosity as to what can you do with all the modern di technology, the digital stuff. Is there a way that you can use all that to sort of to really help a, an old historic film? I was just curious. I, I didn't really know the answer to the question. I, but I thought if we're going to do something, why don't we actually grab that Gallipoli film and see what we can do with it? Uh, the, the other day I was thinking about dragging it back in, online again in our computer system because I think even in the last six years there's software that's been developed. We could do a lot more with it now than we could back six years ago. So. There we go, so there's a Māori television mm. exclusive. Yeah, yeah I'm, well, it's cute. Oh. I'm just, it's just, these are things I'm just curious about. It's like, I, you know, cause, you know, they're really born of questions about what can you do. It's like, it's like no one often thinks about this stuff, really, and mm. all these opportunities are wasted. I mean, it's like, um, there was so much amazing old footage of different things that, that, like, if someone really spruced it up and made it more accessible, and even just that Gallipoli footage in its state now, it, to me, it's more accessible. I mean, when, before, when it was shaking up and down, and the flickers, it's like you... But now it's like reasonably stable and it's reasonably flicker-free and, um, and and it's easier to look at with the eye. It's only much, much easier to watch than it used to be. I think three seconds mm -hmm. in on Heroes of Gallipoli, it says, priceless cinema record of history's most glorious failure. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get your view on whether or not you think Gallipoli was history's most glorious failure. I don't know. It's, uh, I mean, glorious is not a word I'd use, certainly. Nothing glorious about Gallipoli in the slightest. Um, but the whole nationalism thing is interesting. From what I read, what I understand, I mean, the, the, the world in 19, 1914 in New Zealand and, and Australia, obviously, we're talking about New Zealand, it was an opportunity to, to go out into the world and to impress Mother England and to show that we could do something you know, that we could sort of do our bit and maybe we'll do our mother country proud. It was all about doing her proud. And then you also read interviews with the soldiers that went and they were just simply wanting a bit of adventure. They, you know, a great opportunity to get out of the country for a while. What happened in Gallipoli, I think, it, you know, what you certainly read in the diaries that, that, that you, as you, as you read this very slow disillusionment arriving, because there was no doubt that there were so many decisions, so many command decisions that were just not sensible and not well thought through and and that the, 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 the confidence of the of the New Zealand soldier in Gallipoli was was eroded by the experience there um you know you know but nonetheless you know we came out of the first world war by the time it was all finished I think under thinking that okay well that wasn't really um the mother country didn't wasn't really all it was cracked up to be it was actually kind of it was the beginning of the disillusionment with the 
perfection of Mother England, but at the same time, you know, conversely, at the same time the thing was happening, New Zealanders had gained a reputation as terrific soldiers. And so, you know, you imagine a young nation in the days before internet and TV and, you know, the, or the, what, how, how what, New Zealand is never going to make a name for itself, really, uh, any other way. I mean, the All Blacks hadn't really done a hell of a lot back in 1914-18. In um, so how important is it for you to make a film on Gallipoli? Well, you know, Gallipoli hasn't been well served in the cinema. I mean, it's there, there is going to be television miniseries coming out of our ears for for, for next year. Australia is making two or three uh, TV miniseries about Gallipoli, you know, big, epic, spectacular miniseries. So certainly it's going to be a, a, a featured a hell of a lot more than it has been recently. You know, Peter Weir's film is a terrific movie and, uh, you know, nitpicking historical facts is like one thing you can do and that's not ultimately very satisfying. I think it's just as a piece of cinema, it's fantastic. It's, I mean, the thing with, you know, the, the one thing that does drive me nuts is what does, you know, is when people come to me, if I say, oh, you know, I'm interested in Gallipoli, they say, oh, yeah, 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 Gallipoli, I know, I've, se I've seen the film. I mean, that sort of drives me a bit bonkers because, you know, it, I mean, Peter Weir's film, you know, re re represents something that happened on the, on the 6th of August, uh, you know, at 4.30 in the morning, and, and it just was one tiny event of, of, a, of an eight-month-long campaign. It was one very, very small event. And so that's not Gallipoli. That, that's the story of Mel Gibson and his buddy um, and what happened to them in the, in, in the Australian Light Horse on that day, but it's um, certainly not, it's not Gallipoli. One day I certainly would be, um, it's, it's certainly something I've been thinking about for, I've been thinking about it for 20 years, basically, so that hasn't changed. But, uh, and I guess you've already, I mean, some would say you're, if that was the case, and I know you're thinking about Dan Busters, and, and you've met Les Munro. Yeah. He has been almost, I guess, a, an advisor in some way, shape or form yes. to, yes, to a possible Dan yeah, Busters yeah, yeah, yeah. movie yeah, yeah, that you've yeah, talked yeah. a lot about. You know, Dan Busters has always been one of, the, I think, the most terrific true life stories of World War II. I mean, you know, the, 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 the 1955 movie is, Kind of, it's pretty amazing because it's such a, a it sort of, it, it managed to really stir the heartstrings. It sort of makes, you know, it's sort of got a, an incredible um, patriotic energy. But there were three New Zealanders, um, you know, involved in the dams raid. We have one um, with us still, fantastic, you know. There's, I mean, there's the last pilot, the last surviving dam buster pilot of the, of the 18 pilots that, that flew that night. Mm. It's just such a great link. So Les, you've got to, you've got to just Les has got to, got to hang in there till we get this film made. I'm sure he will too. He's a, he's a, he's a great, he's a tough guy. Yeah. This is, I think anybody that was, was, um, you know, anybody that was in Bomber Command was tough. I mean, you had to be. They had real guts, and Les has got guts. Th those guys did so much incredible stuff that it, it does, you know, you, you, you really. I used to sit there thinking, like, do what? Could I really do that? And I, and I, you know, I, I don't know if I could. I mean, I just don't know. I don't know what they had, what that generation had. I, you just think, God, it's like. Unbelievable, unbelievable those flights to Berlin and those those aer airplanes. I mean, I have flown in a Lancaster, and they are they are uh, pretty, you know, they they're not scary to fly, and they're actually incredibly stable, um, solid planes, very very kind of solid in the air. But but you know they they rattle and they creak and there's no insulation in them. There's the Rolls Royce engines are all four four of them are spewing out fumes and gas, and the entire the entire fuselage is filling with the smell of aviation gas. And it's like you, you know, it's a pretty visceral experience. It's, it, all your senses are going. You can't hear a thing. I mean, I was you know I was trying to talk to somebody. Like I mean, you, you and I couldn't conduct a conversation in a Lancaster in flight. You just could not do it. You'd be you just like it's so loud. It's so loud. It seems to me you don't just get a a huge sense of personal satisfaction and fulfilment out of not just researching and being a part of this yeah. and, and, and following it, but there might also be an altruistic kind of end to it and that what you're trying to do is contribute to a further body of knowledge for, for other people to perhaps get a sense of the personal satisfaction that you do in, in this kind of work. Well, it's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's like all the information is there and some of it's fascinating. The question is then, how do you actually uh, generate interest? How how do you actually spark that that what's that spark that gets people's kind of excitement going? I mean, in my generation, it was like my you know I had a grandfather. I not that I ever met him, but I you know I you know so, but but that you know now there, there aren't any good people alive. There aren't any first world war, war people to talk to. There, you know, it's getting further and further away. And so, what is it that needs to happen to actually get? 
you know, young young people, talk about young people, but to get just just anybody, you know, to actually engage with it. I mean, I think you know, I'm hoping that this this centenary of the First World War that um, is coming up is is hopefully there'll be enough things happening in there that maybe will get people people's interest in it. I mean, you know, today we, you know, you hear about people that have Gallipoli ancestors, you know, my great grandfather was there. Oh, well, you know, who did he serve with? What what battalion was he in? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know anything about it. Don't 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 know. Okay, well, you know, that was he's 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 from your family and you don't know. It's like when he could have been actually involved in some pretty interesting stuff if you if he knew. Yeah, I understand you you have a, a huge uh, catalog of of photos that you've been helping people. I know you've been talking to Dr. Monty Suter, who I think is a mm. fellow panelist of yours on the mm. on the hundred centennial panel. Yep. The, and you it would appear get a lot of satisfaction out of just helping people find their way through that research. Monty yeah. being a prime example sure, with the yeah. Pioneer Battalion. I you know I, I I you know there's I mean there's so few photos of the of the Maori boys at Gallipoli. I mean there's a few and they're quite you know ones that get used all the time, a handful of them. And um, you know but I, I I sort of been through all the all the photographs that, I, that I've got, and, and a lot of them are high-resolution photographs, and so I've been able to zoom them up, and I suddenly there's a there's a Maori guy there and a Maori guy here, and I, you suddenly can chart them. I'm I'm a sort of, I'm I'm a, I'm a, Ma a Maori hunter. <laughs> I sort of, but you know, I sort of actually and great, and so I take a freeze frame of the photo and I send it, I send it to um to Dr. Suter. It's like it's like he's you know and he and it's like these are like photos where they, these guys are to be to be found if you just dig a, dig a bit deeper. It's, it's really fun. It's fun doing that sort of thing. So. so. So how would you characterise then the way we as a country commemorate Anzac Day, commemorate Gallipoli now? Well, I mean, and you know, should we follow in our, in our Anzac brethren's footsteps and perhaps celebrate rather than commemorate? Well, I mean, that's a interesting question. I, celebration, commemoration. I, you know, it is. I just, I, you know, it's. I mean, I think you. I think you can celebrate for sure. I don't think it's a, it's a bad thing to celebrate. It's like, what are you doing? You're celebrating the achievements of, of soldiers that were doing their very, very best at the time, and whether they're, they're, they're our, our, our grandparents, great-grandparents or not, they, they were still, they were risking their lives to do the very best that they could, and why not celebrate that? Is, is that something to, to celebrate? It's, you know, you commemorate the, the ones that died, a, a lot of them were killed, and that deserves commemoration. You can do both. I mean, it's, it doesn't, one doesn't have to exclude the other, really. I know you told me to call you Peter, so, mm -hmm. so Peter Jackson. <laughs> On behalf of Māori Television, thank you very much for your time today. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you.